Greetings. Uh, we are going to begin our second uh, session this morning, and we have the pleasure of uh, hearing our second keynote speaker, Lev Kraft. Uh, Lev and I have known each other for a long time, and he's one of the veterans in the British Society and in IAPS, and has been uh, attending for quite a number of years here. We were just trying to remember. He thinks Cheltenham was his first meeting with uh, IAPS and the, the British Society and IAPS were together at that time. So some of you have heard Lev before. If you haven't, you're in for a treat. So I'm looking forward to uh, hearing this talk myself. And Lev's going to be talking about a topic that has uh, gained more and more attention in our literature, uh, the rights of animals uh, that are used in sporting contexts. So Lev, greetings. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be introduced to you. And it's a privilege to be here. Thank you to organizers as well to give me this uh, keyboard position to have more time <laughs> to annoy you. And my topic is animals in sport, unnecessary suffering or entertaining competition. Now first about the state of the art in this uh, domain. Contemporary approach to animal ethics depends on three men, to say nothing of Jeremy Bentham. Those three men are Peter Zinger, Tom Reagan, and Gary Francione. Benson's ethical approach to animals must be understood because of his overall ethical legislation system based not on rational deductions but on the principle of pleasure and pain as the most universal. Its universality calls for animals to be included into those beings which, as they are sentient, that is, they can feel pleasure and pain, should be treated accordingly. His principle is contained in famous statement on correct question applied to animals, I quote, the question is not can they reason nor can they talk, but can they suffer? And uh, the last 1823 edition, which uh, has been in a note of 1789, this uh, topic is here again, and the argument is the same, so he insisted on it. It is important to note that in contemporary animal ethics, Bentham is quite often used as a support for many different positions, including those which he would never accept. For instance, in Bentham's ethical system, there can be no innate or natural rights, neither of humans nor of animals. While in animal ethics, such innate rights are usually taken as a starting point. Also, his approach to killing animals to eat them is positive, because I quote, the death they suffer at our hands usually is and always could be speedier and thus less painful than what would await them in the inevitable course of nature, unquote. On the other side, there is a conclusion that there are animals which are much more rational than any human infant. However, in Bentham's approach, this is not an argument in favor of animals' rights, but against rational approach which measures amount of rationality in a being and denies its rights if it does not find enough evidence of rationality. Denying somebody's rationality is the usual introduction of unacceptable repression, as with slaves or women, and it is applied for animals as well. No hierarchy of reason following its different amount presented in a being can justify inequality of creatures which can feel pleasure and pain. That is Bentham's golden principle. Peter Zinger, published his seminal book, Animal Liberation, in 1975, so it's a long story already. And his starting idea was to extend struggles for liberation from discrimination of humans on basis of race or gender to non-human species. He researched the cases of laboratory animals and of meat factories, but not others, because his idea was to develop a philosophical ground, not empirical, for demands to treat non-humans equally. Still, his theoretical interest was deeply involved with strengthening of a movement from the title. He announced in preface in 1975 edition, I quote, this book is about tyranny of human over non-human animals, unquote. What he wanted was animals to be, quote, treated as independent, sentient beings that they are, and not as means to human ends, unquote. The liberal movement, I quote, demands an expansion of our moral horizons so that practices that were previously regarded as natural and inevitable are now seen as intolerable. To introduce animals as sentient beings means to involve Bentham or to disclose utilitarian is their ethical approach. Equality is treated as a moral idea and not as a factual equality of this or that characteristics of beings. I quote, if a being suffers, there can be no moral justification for refusing to take that suffering into consideration, and indeed to count it equally with the like suffering, if rough comparisons can be made, of any other being. Unquote. To refuse treating all beings which uh, can feel pain and pleasure, equally has its name. When we claim that people of other color than white 
are not equal, that is racism. If you say that women are not equal, we call it sexism. And in case of non-human animals, such denial of equality is called speciesism. Expression first used by Richard Ryder in 1971. What Singer argues is that there are no philosophically and especially ethically plausible arguments for speciesism, which is putting human beings above all other beings as concerns their ethical treatment. Despite that, Singer joins the Great Ape Project of Paola Cavalieri in 1993 with an excuse that it might help all non-human animals to support those of them which are so near to humans and represent a bridge across the wide historical species. Tom Bregan, who published The Case for Animal Rights in 1983, does not promote different goals from Singer of pro-animal movement. His definition of goals is acceptable by both. I quote, the total abolition of the use of animals in science, the total dissolution of commercial animal agriculture, the total elimination of commercial and sport hunting and traffic, unquote. In 1976, they added it together, Animal Rights and Human Obligations, a book. But their philosophical and ethical arguments against animal suffering differ fundamentally. Regan reforms Kant's approach to morality, inserting the experiencing subject of a life, where Kant spoke of rational beings, and attributes rights to all beings who have a life which matters to them. Kant's moral differentiation between means and ends applies now to them all. I quote, the fundamental wrong is the system that allows us to view animals as our resources, here for us, to be eaten or surgically manipulated or exploited for sport or money, unquote. As the previous mentioned, sport here stands for any of use of animals as means for our entertainment, which does not respect their right to be subject of their own life and uh, treat them as objects. He even uses the expression which announces later arrival of a third party in animal ethics, Gary Francione, where he explains why dog has no rights. If a neighbor kicks your dog, he's doing harm to your property, not to dog. As he is introducing inherent value of all individuals regardless of species, race, sex, nation, etc., he must deny that other moral foundations can help in the case of animals and vice versa, that moral foundations which cannot help animals are philosophically problematic. Among such, he exposed contractarianism, because animals cannot become parties in a moral contract, and criticized the approach of kindness to animals, because he does not recognize animals' rights independently of our kindness. He refused utilitarianism, as well, with its principle of equality and utility, because it does not recognize value of each individual, but only that of our feelings. What he put in the center of his universal ethics is the inherent value of all beings which are subject of life of their own. Now, differences between Zinger and Reagan conditioned their dispute, which Zinger articulated as a choice between animal liberation or animal rights. Zinger recognizes the same cause they are both fighting for, but finds their difference fundamental. But not in terms of animal rights. The difference is even deeper. Singer explains that if humans have rights, then animals must have them too. The problem lies elsewhere, I quote. Thus my rejection of animal rights has nothing to do with the fact that they are the rights of animals. It has to do with the fact that they are rights. After thorough consideration of Reagan's proposal of rights, Singer concludes, I quote, we can conclude that respect for the inherent value of subject of a life is not a reason for embracing the rights view rather than the utilitarian. This is a conflict between two approaches to moral philosophy and its legal consequences, which involves also the discussion on the rights to have rights, proposed by Hannah Arendt as the aftermath of totalitarianism and developed further by George Agamben, whose homo sacer is strict of his fundamental right. That, of course, is my commentary on their fight. The status of animals in relationship to rights is different. Human beings without the right to have rights may be killed but not sacrificed. Animals may be killed and sacrificed as well. This means that human being is excluded from the political community where he or she otherwise belongs. Animals on the other side were never part of any political community and are not excluded from it. They just do, do not enter it in the first place. Reagan tries to develop argument for inclusion of animals into the community of those beings which have the right to have rights. Singer as utilitarian finds rights theories to be too inflexible to provide better ground for animal liberation. Now to the third one. Gary L. Francione is of different opinion to both of them. He embraces the position of rights, or better, just one right, which animals have, and that is their right not to be a property. As he came later, the pioneers of animal liberation 
under animal rights, he had to explain why this movement did not succeed to introduce major change in the status of, and treatment of animals during this process of, of fighting for their rights. More or less always arriving at treating animals humanely as a slogan and nothing more. He translates ethical standards and moral obligation into legalese to show that the main obstacle comes because we treat animals always as somebody's property or as a commodity offered as such on the market by its owner. The right of animals not to be a property or a commodity is the only plausible way to make animals' existence better on philosophically well-grounded argumentation, he thinks. This means that Francione speaks about abolition, not just about rights, and that his theory of animal rights is derived solely from sentience presented as inevitable moral point of departure. Francione names abuse of animals for entertainment, including sport of any kind and any definition, including total abolition of domestic pen pets as well. It is interesting that animals introduced by radical animal rights theory, which includes that nobody could own any non-human being, seems to have unforeseen, even unwanted consequences. The most surprising one is that animals get a status of untouchables. That is a status which is similar to the status of untouchable animal sucker but the exclusion of unsanctioned killing. In Francione's legal community of humans, the whole bunch of animals are beings which cannot share with us any community membership. Therefore, the appearance of animals in entertainment or sport is totally forbidden. Another unforeseen consequence is the total abolition of treating humans as property and of commodities should be another consequence of Francione's position. It's logical. This does not mean just abolition, and of course it was not taken, but he this does not mean just abolition of slavery and other institutions of ex exploitation and discrimination. It means that no human or non-human being should be treated as commodity. But we are treated as commodity. Humans are treated as commodities from the beginning of market economy in modernity. And working force market is fundamental for value production. The argument that to sell one's ability to work as a kind of property does not mean that a person has been sold as a slave market, but it still means that he or she has become a commodity. So, if we agree with Jim Perry, which is very hard, <laughs> definition of sport, you know it very well, his definition of sport, here it is, uh, and he repeated the same definition with well-developed additional argument in 2020 text, where you can look about it. Then animal ethics is not really interested in sport understood as Olympic sports, which this definition is about. In animal ethics, crucial authors whom we shortly examine certainly do not support any sport which demands use or abuse of animals, and most strongly express in Francione's animal ethics included in human entertainment. Naming mostly circus and zoo on one and ethical, ethnical animal sports, blood sports, animal races, hunting and fishing for fun on the other. It is true that among Olympic sports, as defined by Perry, there are only three sports which include animals. The equestrian events of jumping and of dressage, and equestrian show jumping as a part of modern pantheon. These disciplines already have precise and detailed rules of conduct and of course welfare during competition, training and travel. But these sports are usually not even mentioned in discussion on animal ethics or animal welfare. Sport is not the focus of animal ethics. In its argumentation, sport games are sometimes silently included under entertainment and dismissed as abusive because of blood sports and horse or dog races and so on. Olympic sports which include animals are only few and do not deserve mentioning, it seems. But why is it so? One possible answer is that sport and meat industry moved in reverse directions. At the beginning of the 20th century, blood sports were still the most popular and important segment of sport, animal sports included. Then the process started which step by step put most blood sports with animals or without them, of course, out of use or out of law. While highly re regulated, with ethical regulation as well, association sport progressed and got public popularity. During the same period, small and medium farmers, with few animals for their family and some for the market, disappeared, and gigantic meat industry took over. Confronted with such massive cruelty, pioneers of animal ethics did not bother too much about already regulated animal sports. Looking at it from other side, animal ethics, using very dated notion of sport, introduced Puritan approach to all entertainment, silently including sport in more recent understanding into this dated idea of what sport is, namely, sport is something not necessary, not serious, and therefore an unnecessary activity, especially when using or abusing animals for human sport. 
On the side of sport, as Olympic sport, we can show how equestrian Olympic sport regulates horse welfare. On the side of animal ethics, conceptual problem, we can open problematic relationship between non-human animals and human animals. So first, Olympic regulation, just a short introduction. I know that some of you know better than me about it. It may be that animal sport does not get much direct attention of animal ethics, but Olympic equestrianism is in constant attack from animal welfare and animal rights circles, despite all regulation International Equestrian Federation, FEI, which is in French, uh, adopted. There are six events of these three uh, disciplines, I will not name it, but there is, both are dressage and jumping, a common equestrian sport disciplines, and eventing combined stadium and cross-country jumping, with dressage in three days event. Additionally, there is also modern pentathlon, which we mentioned, and FEE has a well-developed code of conduct getting longer and longer year by year. It covers good horse management, training methods, farrier and tech, transport and transit, fitness and competence, health status, doping and medication, surgical procedures, pregnant or recently fought mares, misuse of aids, whips, spurs, competition areas, ground surfaces, extreme weather, stabling of events, veterinary treatment, referral centers, competition injuries, euthanasia, retirement, and education. This all is now covered by rules. So as the FEE says, I quote, the FEE requires all those involved in international equestrian sport to adhere to the code of conduct. And the code is a document which is still developing. That code could be more of a declaration than field practice has been revealed to adversaries of animal sport by Tokyo Scandal by Tokyo Scandal, when during modern pentathlon competitor and potential medalist, Anka Schmoy, cried in desperation because her horse with telling name Saint Boy did not accept to follow her guidance and stopped in front of the obstacle, excuse me, like a mule. Her coach Kim Raisley punched a horse as a last resort, not with real power, more from the same desperation which inspired his athlete to cry. One of the reasons for this scandal was that horses were chosen at random so that competitors don't compete using their own horses, which would beside full adaptation and understanding between horse and rider, also means that those who have more money will assure their access to be best animals. So that's what's what we wanted to be avoided by this random choice. The punch became a golden case for all animal welfare and animal rights activists to demand that all animal sports be banned, start, starting with those on the Olympic program. And, uh, Olympic authorities decided that after LA Games of 2028, the riding will cease to be a pentathlon event. So that's the result. But on the other side, nobody was really, really punished because not, no, no, no code was uh, at that time allowing for punishment of, of uh, both of involved persons. Anyway, uh, the discussion goes now, of course, that uh, there should be a kind of bond between horse and rider and that this is something to be, uh, let's say, regulated further. So that this kind of random uh, uh, getting of a horse should never happen again. Darwin, the most scandalous of his claims was, and remains, that there is no deep rupture between the human-like apes, as they are called anthropocentrically, and humans. Even if this precipice is not absolute, in anthropological research there is a quest for the last ape and the first human going on. Agamben told us about it. Anthropocentrism, together with ideas about human absolute superiority over all the other living species, is one of the most visible reasons for treatment of animals as means for human purpose, and not as being in their own right. At least in principle, we have much more in common with human ancestors than with God whose supranatural image we would like to be. Sorry for this theological commentary. But this kind of absolute differentiation between humans and animals comes also as a result of animal ethics. To allow sentient beings to get to their own maximum pleasure and the least pain caused by humans, humans must stop to meddle with animal life. George Agamben starts his book, The Open, Man and Animal, from the point of differentiation between animal and human. To subvert animal ethics against its demand of total divide between human and non-human animals, I propose to take this as a sign of similar but topsy-turvy intervention. The name of this intervention in Agamben is anthropological machine. Its tendency is to produce an active divide, and the activity of the divide is to keep apart man and animal against 
evolutionary sequence, they belong together. So that in spite of certain lineage between man and uh, animal humans, humans still have their absolute non-animal and unnatural superiority over the whole living and non-living world. And that the divide continues in humans as well, because struggle between human and animal becomes an engine of humanization as a historical process on humans. Humans are incomplete species, which has to finalize its supranatural potential. We know that there are special groups of these less complete species inside human species. I'm not going to that, but that's a result of a topological machine too. As already Heidegger explained and Agamben repeated, after the First World War, such high opinion of human potential cannot find the support. And philosophy after the Second World War. The philosophy of enlightenment and support in column is over. Still, after postmodern attempt to get rid of modernity and its modernist ideological support, it is possible to conclude that what we have is its second modernity. And uh, this uh, second modernity is by Ulrich Beck, uh, that all the forces of modernity are still at work in spite of our dissatisfaction and loss of faith in our own self to become masters of the universe. So he professed that the abyss previously built to confirm our human superiority over all the other beings of this world really proves that we are factors of this world's collapse and perhaps even death. The divide between humans and animals thus serves to safeguard the world from the human race. But if the anthropological machine works in opposite direction, as it works now, it still works in the manner invented by humanism and enlightenment, as a carrier of anti-humanism and anti-enlightenment now, under these second modernity circumstances. It might work if a problem was simple, send humans away and all problems of earthly nature will solve themselves. Still, humans are a product of nature, and problems of this planet produced by us Nature itself, left to its own productive forces, cannot balance into self-managing of system again. It cannot manage the self-management system of nature again. It needs human engagement. That's what we are talking about all these years and getting no result. And human engagement means also a care for species, animals included. In Anthropocene, animals too have become a part of human culture. And a radical change of this culture is needed to get a sustainable culture of care for the earth and its living creatures, but not total abyss, which will leave nature without culture and animals without humans. To create a sustainable structure of life, there are two ways. To restore definite abyss between human and non-human world, or to develop a relationship of care between humans and the world. Animal ethics proceeds from a conclusion that this is not possible. On the other side, if we leave this leave with this world alone, it will irresistibly perish together with us humans. Intervention demanded by animal ethics seemingly solves the problem of violence and pain inflicted on the animals by humans. But by not seeing the whole problem of relationship between humans and the world, remember that it is only humans who have the world, its solution is imperfect and misses the main point of relationship, culture, nature, and anthropocene. The second point made by uh, Gary Francione is a critique of unsuccessful animal welfare movements, that their limit is private property of animals, which should be abolished at the start if one wants to make animal welfare possible. This uh, legal philosophy approach needs some political economy critique. I already mentioned, because uh, uh, humans are also commodities, so we should uh, treat animals and humans alike, even in that. But I would like more to show you, to illustrate what I have in mind, the project with elephants paint. From 1998, by Russian artists living in the USA from 1980s on, Vitaly Komar and Alexander Milan. So I give you. But no stone. So that I can proceed. So, the aim of the project was to help elephants who ceased to be working force in Thailand. Project later expanded to other Asian countries where elephant unemployment became a problem. Two artists became famous by their sorts art, a postmodern amalgam of socialist realism and surrealist ideological constructions, and now plan to give the American audience a case of American kind of sorts art. In the States, neoliberalism was a religion of capitalist leadership, and its tenet was that it's wrong to distribute health to the poor and the unemployed. What must be done is to teach them how to survive on their own. So, 
Komar and Milani invented how elephants could survive on their own by painting. Now, after 24 years, camps of elephants, I've been to Metaman camp, which is shown also in this video. There are many camps now in Thailand and in other Asian countries, and elephant paintings are sold for respectable amounts and appear uh, at Sotheby and other auctions. In addition, elephants dung, rich with cellulose, are used to produce special papers used in painting. Unemployment is a result of capitalist progress, as employment is too. Animals are entering human world not only as private property of their owners, but as moments of capital production, that is, production for profit, and they are in that regard in similar position as any other worker or material engaged in production of food, food work, entertainment, and so on. To be a person in modernity, because this Metaman camp is also about entertainment, people are visiting it in thousands, in hundreds of thousands, to see elephants, how they paint, and to go around and then to, of course, ride elephants a little bit and so on. It's a whole program. So it's entertainment at its best. <laughs> To be a person in modernity, by the way, means that one either has his or her hands with means of production and is looking for labor of the other to start profitable production himself or herself. Or he or she is looking for work to get what is needed for survival. Philosophers are of the other side. <laughs> the difference between animals and humans is that humans are free to choose their masters or not, and animals do not have the right. Simply to abolish their connectedness with human world will have the same consequences as unemployment has for humans in neoliberal structure. Without possibility to find such solutions, as in case of elements or all animals. To conclude from both aspects, to introduce total isolation between human and animal world would mean a disaster for the animal world and human world as well. What might help our common world might be to abolish up to now dominant way of exploitation and introduce care for the world and earth both in Heideggerian sense, as prevailing attitude, including sport, with or without animals. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have... I left too much time now. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, have plenty of time for, for questions. Yeah? Uh, <clears throat> do you think it's necessary to... Uh, believe in animal rights uh, in order to espouse causes related to animal respect and animal welfare? Well, I think because, yeah, you, we have the discussion about animal rights and utilitarian approach of sentient beings. Approach of sentient beings is good for ethics, but I think uh, in legal terms, if you want to defend animals from any violence, we would need rights. Because I think that right, I'm not specialist, of course, in law, there are some people here who are, but I think that without introducing animal rights, and that's what's happening in, 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 in illegal terms, uh, there, there is, I think, no other way. If we introduce animal rights, as, or animals' right not to be uh, uh, abused, uh, involving human rights, animals not to be abused, then we are on the wrong way to protect them. Because then human being decides when and how. So I think, yes, yeah, they have to be given the right. Uh, and they have to be given very probably somebody who will speak in their name. We have in law the position of bridges, which are treated as persons when somebody is fighting that they shouldn't be uh, built or they shouldn't be destroyed. So we have the already Roman law, by the way. So we, we, we can always speak about animals as persons in, in legal terms, under legal terms. And I think that is for, for, the, for the legal solution of the problem in the way. But it doesn't mean that we as philosophers uh, should accept, uh, you know, that just bluntly that, okay, they have rights. Uh, we should discuss this problem between uh, sentient beings and rights and so on because it is a real ethical problem. And as I mean, it's not solved by saying that the whole problem is the private property. That was my position. Thank you. Thank you. For me, this, this elephant drawing is a little similar like, you know, bird uh, riding bicycle in circles or bird para speaking in human words, etc. Uh, doesn't it torture of these animals? Well, there was also the, the reaction to that, of course, because it is entertainment and because uh, uh, 
everybody thinks that that uh, they are doing just you know repeating what they've been taught like like parrots and so on. Uh, the problem is that of course we treat animals as non-rational beings. Animals are rational beings. You know there is there is a lot of reason to speak about reason in animals in Darwin's sense. Everything we have as humans was developed in animals already. So uh, uh, elephants are not stupid animals. They learn and they also try to create. It was shown in the, in the process uh, when, when it started first in, in the States, in zoo uh, teaching. Uh, they also taught uh, chimpanzee, Betsy. Uh, at that time, I think it was a Chicago zoo. And uh, very soon, uh, the, her works were, were also exhibited <laughs> and prized by, by, by critics and so on. But uh, uh, it is not just uh, uh, repeating because uh, uh, you see that this coordinated movement of, of elephant, uh, when, when, when she, she, she uh, women, uh, elephants are much more, uh, I would say, uh, rational and <laughs> accepting creation than <laughs> very probably uh, male elephants are good for them. <laughs> and uh, they do something which was not provided before. Because, of course, they are not, you know, they, 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 you know that they remember. Their memory, of course, is one of the best in, in the animal world. So they do, uh, sometimes they get together and three or five of them are doing also abstract expressionism for the sake of Clement Greenberg. <laughs> uh, so I would say, yes, on one side, it is something we are enjoying as an attraction for humans. And on the other side, I think, and that is something I couldn't find in, in, uh, in research. Uh, everybody is researching animal pain, but very few are researching animal pleasure. And animal pleasure should be researched very seriously. There are only two or three texts on the internet when you find, you know, who wrote about it. So they are not treating that, uh, which, which should be, because uh, I think that, uh, let's say, it would be very interesting to see, do elephants enjoy painting? Of course, Bentham would say they enjoy painting much more than the, the work they had before, which is now done by tractors and so on. But, you know, that's what I, what I want to say about it. Good morning. Uh, thank, thanks, Um I think I was going to sort of pick up Jim's point in relation to does the language of rights, is it really necessary? And, and uh, you, I think you talked about the equestrianism and was it Kim Reisner that was a German rider in, a, a quest, in the equestrianism um, and a coach I think of band for punching the horse as well and, and I think what it probably illustrates is actually humans have really close relationships with animals um, and the animals trust the humans that they know and, and, and I, I agree with you in terms of animals are rational and they probably don't understand kind of the point of sport because they're way they're irrational, um, but they will trust those that they have relationships with, and it's about that, that trust. So, auf geht's Annika Schoen. That's what you mentioned. Yeah, so it's, um, it, I think, really, it's a, we don't need necessarily the language of rights, it's about understanding our relationships with animals and animals' relationships with us. Would you agree with that? Well, I mentioned code of conduct of the VI, which is growing and growing because of uh, cases which happen here and there. And uh, nobody can say that they are very numerous cases, but they are telling. So, uh, as I told before, I think that uh, this relationship between human and animal is something I would not abolish. Uh, I wouldn't say that abolition is needed like, you know, uh, in this uh, uh, animal ethics as it is developing now because it's going together with radical movements. Uh, so there should be an intervention both in animal ethics as well as there should be intervention in animal sport ethics. And uh, that's one side of it. The other side of it is that uh, as, as, I, as, I, as I gave an example of association sport with its roots and meat industry. It, it, they're going in different directions. And the same, uh, I would say, goes with animal sports. Step by step, you know, they are, they are becoming regulated. Now, this regulation leaves your question untouched. Uh, 
because uh, we humans in sport go over our capacities and ability m more than 100% to give is what is the expectation and we are taking animals with us. Is there animal pleasure in giving more than it, than it, than it is uh, 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 than it is capable of. So sport is giving more than you are capable of. It's always this, uh, this uh, uh, extreme ethics of, of, of achievement. And uh, that, that, I would say, is, is the real question of animal sports. That's why I said that we should uh, research uh, animal pleasure. Because, of course, any rider would say to you that uh, he or she has a relationship with animals, that they are one. You know, it's a flow, like in St. Mihai, Chief St. Mihai spoke about flow in, in people, but that is a flow in the relationship between animal and human in riding. So we should uh, accept all those disciplines which respect this flow and eliminate those who are not. But first, of course, it has to be uh, researched what is the animal pleasure. Any rider would tell you, animal has a pleasure in this, it, 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 it's fine for her to do this. As you know, you, if you have a dog, you have to go three times a day, to walk around with him, perhaps for your own health, but you have to do for the sake of the dog. So not to, not to give him this, this pleasure would be really, really uh, uh, violent to the animal. And we know the dog enjoys going out. So that, that's my point, but of course there are many further things to be developed in the research to get there. Uh, just picking up on animal sports, I'll, I'll take a, a contrary view. If we look at how animals have been treated in sport and entertainment, it's, it, we allow things to happen and then we take a view that that's too harmful. So, that, so we've outlawed bear baiting, animals will come out of circuses and, and things like aquariums. But unless you move to a rights-based thing, and we've struggled with children with this, so common law countries which have not granted children rights, are still at the mercy of adults determining where the boundary is. So unless you, so things like corporal punishment have become controversial aspects because if you don't recognise rights, then it's adults who determine the behaviour and what's acceptable. So if you want to protect animals and look after them, then unless you go to a rights-based system, I think it, you're, it, it's a flawed process legally. Well, that is why I'm so suspicious about uh, this uh, sign in uh, animal rights uh, uh, discussion, also in, in uh, animal ethics, uh, which is uh, 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 an attitude against any joy and entertainment. It's purely an approach to ethics. So it's better to leave animals alone, you know, than to treat them, but it's also It allows for punishment if you don't, because it says leave the animals on the other side because it's always, we always do violence to them. If you always do violence to them, so that the only thing to do is you know, to, to, to keep them on, on the other side of the world, not in the world as human world. So I would say that here, uh, uh, Puritanism and uh, the right to punish the others comes together. So even if, you know, because, because uh, uh, the, 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 when you allow for joy and entertainment for everybody and for children, for animals, for so on, you have to be uh, moderate, not humble, moderate in, in, in uh, which is one, I think, of the, of the rules also for, for, for law application. You moderate, moderate in, in, in punishment, uh, not, uh, not uh, uh, to... to measure punishment uh, against uh, uh, pedagogical effect, which would be better if we, if we kill you forever, <laughs> hang you and so on, because you are a bad guy, you know, and so on. And this, I, th I think this, this approach allows for violence, because it allows for violence of law too much. Animals better uh, 
starting points that you would you know, incorporate in a, in a sports law or sports rules so it would be acceptable uh, way of animals in sports? Well, I think if you read the, the rules introduced by, by Equestrian Federation, I think that it's quite okay. I think that's enough, you know, uh, perhaps even too abundant ruling all the things and so on, but at the beginning usually it is necessary to put everything in written form and so on. Uh, I don't think that, that uh, the solution is, is uh, anywhere else, because uh, that, that we just discussed that in, 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 in break. Uh, this doesn't mean that some violence will never occur again. Uh, also with this case which you've been showed, uh, it will appear from time to time, but we have a regulation and you don't have to be tempted, which is also one of temptation in ethics and in law, to over-regulate things. Because then, of course, you get a situation where everything is criminal. <laughs> All the time is something criminal going on. So you have to leave, and I prefer here, uh, uh, I would say, one of the things which happened to us continentals, that uh, this Anglo-Saxon uh, approach where, where judiciary is also a source of law, and not just a parliamentary source of law, where, where you have more uh, free hands to decide what to, what to decide, uh, is much better than this, our tendency, which is German law tendency, to over-regulate everything. We have now laws which are so long, you know, that nobody, even those who are applying them, do not read them whole. And they are looking for where is the problem, you know, but they don't read it uh, the whole. So uh, I would say that, that uh, this uh, uh, belief that, that uh, not the system, but people in the system can, can solve ma many things without uh, new, uh, more abundant uh, law rules support, uh, I, I would take it uh, as a better point of departure than uh, over-regulating things. So the, the fee is somehow already over-regulated. You, you talked about the um, disappearance of blood sports, and um, would you say there is a relation, a correlation between the uh, rise of violence and uh, yeah, uh, transgression in Olympian sports? Uh, as you might know, Bataille he wrote a lot about bullfighting, relating them to boxing and other more violent expression of modern sport? Well, first I don't think that, that uh, Olympic sport are excelling in violence. Uh, I think they are also getting better, even those who were more violent. Uh, and that is the tendency of 100 years. Uh, when. Uh, asked in a series about the future of uh, this series from the 20s in England. Uh, the future of sport was also a book. And uh, already then, uh, the conclusion was that blood sport will disappear. And it is disappearing and it remains now as ethnic sport, which somewhere is like, you know, not just bullfighting, cockfighting and so on, which is always connected with, with betting machine going on and so on. And as, as we know, it's forbidden in most countries. Uh, so uh, th that's why I said that the process of this kind of blood violence, you know, what we have, I would say more, is the, 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 the uh, social and psychological violence. Uh, and human to human violence, anyway. <laughs> but not, not uh, uh, this kind of violence, which is bloody violence. Uh, even martial sports, we know, were reformed very much and very much new uh, disciplines were introduced which are not contact, martial sports and so on. So I think that, that uh, you know, uh, some sports are much more dangerous than those which we still think are violent sports like boxing and so on. <laughs> some people haven't asked a question then, Jim. I Thank you for the presentation. I'm wondering how much of this has to do with jurisdiction or kind of, yeah, delineating 
whose responsibility it is to punish and, and regulation as opposed to animal rights. And even like the animal rights question, is it possible that something like this, when we're talking about punishment in a different country, might have garnered punishment, but just here it didn't? So as far as focusing on rights as opposed to, yeah, just like jurisdiction or like who's responsible uh, to kind of pursue these sorts of things should be more of the focus? Mm -hmm. Well, there was a discussion, also a question, when you get uh, in a problem uh, at the sea, uh, do you help your dog first or your son? So an ethical discussion about that. And the, 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 the result of this discussion among uh, animal ethics uh, supporters was that, of course, your son. There are no rights of animals above or rights of, of your blood relationship which tells that uh, even where they were introduced, and they were introduced mostly all around the world, uh, uh, legal support against any kind of violent treatment of animals in agriculture and everywhere else, uh, the, the, the execution of law, of course, does not privilege this kind of intervention. It's still treated as something minor offense, not as important as some other could be, like those which involve humans. So we didn't change the, the main uh, aim of anthropological machine. Uh, even when you have legal support, uh, even police, you know, would, would not go, would be reluct reluctant to go examine the uh, 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 death of an animal. Uh, they would more, of course, go to examine uh, the death of, uh, of, 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 of human being and so on. And you know that this kind is, ha is happening also in, in the other cases of, of, of differentiated treatment of groups of people. So uh, what goes with animal ethics, I would say, is that uh, it's always also the de fabula narrata. It speaks about us, not only how, how, what kind of people are we, it speaks about what can happen to us as well. Because what can happen to animals can happen to us as well. So we are still treating animals differently, even when you have low support. That's, I think, what's happening. I don't know enough about that, you know, but I think about reports I've been seeing at the internet and so on. Um, it, was, when it was raising my hand because I couldn't see the moderator, but this is Danny. I was just wondering, uh, thank you for the presentation. I think I, I really like this topic because I think it makes us you know, step outside of the boundaries that we understand as human to consider the other forms of life. Um, so I was wondering if perhaps a better term for this, like when you said animals are rational beings, well I understand your point, I was just thinking that perhaps conscious may be a better word, because rational is a man-made concept, right? So like, how could we fit an animal who's not a human into a man-made concept? I was just wondering if that's something you would consider, or, or if not, like, why? No, I, 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 I exactly accept that. Uh, if, if you followed, uh, I, I said already that this treatment of uh, rationality is something which gives right to use violence on animals. Mm -hmm. which, as much as it did before on children, because they are also non-rational and we have to guide them, and they don't understand yeah. anything else but, you know, violent guidance because they, don't, they cannot understand rational arguments. So hard to argument with them. And, you know, you, you get that to women, you get that to hysterical women, that's non-rational, and so on. So yes, I agree completely with that it's uh, better to speak about uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, the other uh, approach. But I was using this of rational animals because they use it in animal ethics, you know. Because here is, here is a discussion going on, and because Jeremy Bentham was exactly uh, against using a rational mm -hmm. approach, because he was also supporting not just animals, but also children and women. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jim, Jim. And his, his body is still waiting to resurrect. <laughs> <laughs> still in his yeah. <laughs> Jim? Yeah, I'm a bit, uh, as an aside, I'm a bit worried about the <clears throat> elephant art. And if anybody else is a bit worried about it, you might look at YouTube. Um, elephant artist, here's why making an elephant paint is cruel, not cute. The truth about elephant paintings, some um, uh, uh, animal rights group uh, 
uh, talk about torture, elephants forced to paint love. Inside the dark world of captive animal wildlife tourism, all that kind of thing. So I'm a bit, I'm a bit worried about the idea that Af African art is a wonderful ex way of expression and uh, pleasure for the elephant, as well as providing an income generating source, because it's not an income generating source for the elephant at all. Right? So I know some, some guys are getting rich out of elephants. That's, uh, that's something. But it raises for me the question of autonomy. I would be, I would, I would be impressed with elephant art only if the elephant produced its own uh, right. paint brush way. or something, yeah. or it would produce its own paints, or and then it would uh, have its own ideas. But it's taught out of paint stripes and something that looks like a tree and something that looks like an elephant, mm -hmm. and that's all they do, right? And they're made to do that when they're very small, mm -hmm. and it's produced a certain way. So, so elephant art, I want to say. You can't have art mm -hmm. without autonomy. Mm -hmm. And neither can you have rights without mm -hmm. autonomy. So what you need for animals in sport, uh, if we are to have animals at all in sport, um, I, I, I'd be against. But anyway, if we are to have animals in sport, it's about animal protections, exactly. right? And, but those protections are usually couched in terms of human duties. Right? So the autonomous agent in here is the, is the human whose duty it is to protect the animals. And so uh, I, I want to say, uh, what's the relationship between having rights and being an autonomous creature? Because if we wanted to, if, if, if we respected animal autonomy, we'd leave the buggers alone. That they would all be wild, right? We wouldn't have them for food. We wouldn't have them as pets. Right? We, we, we wouldn't exploit them in any way. Every interaction between animals and humans is non-autonomous interaction. So did you want an answer to that or a sort of statement? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, the question is, what's the relationship between autonomy and rights? Yeah. You, can, you, you will get an answer because you are an autonomous being, of course. You, you deserve an answer. <laughs> first, first, I would say that, uh, you know, uh, I don't know about violence to these elephants, because violence to elephants is a very dangerous thing. <laughs> you know, elephants can do something immediately or later, which is very harmful to you. They can use violence, so I don't think that they will learn to to pay by violence. That's one side, but the more important side is art. Uh, let's say uh, the case of the 60s neo avant-garde art. Let's say the end of 50s already in Japan, when. Uh, uh, the group uh, started to, to do what Neo, Neo Avangar did. Uh, at the exhibition, uh, they put uh, their representative, Kazuo Shiraga, uh, in the air, uh, you know, just flowing around with uh, uh, color uh, on his hands uh, and, and on his legs, dripping down. And the result was uh, artwork. Is that different for, for, for elephant painting? Uh, yes, yes, a lot, a lot different. Because what's happened, the, the autonomous agent is not the guy swinging on the, the autonomous agent is the people who produce the artwork. The problem is, uh, aren't animals autonomous agents? That's the question. Because uh, you know that animal ethics believe that uh, greater part of mammals are autonomous actors of their own life. And uh, I think that also uh, uh, analysis and research show that that's true. It's not uh, very probably comparable to all humans do, but there is something autonomous about animals too. That's why I said that's why I said that you have to see more if they enjoy, enjoy it. You know? We can carry on the autonomy <laughs> debate in a second. That's a good question. <laughs> yes, son. Yeah, I guess my question is. Kind of similar to Jim's question, probably sounds a bit radical. Because if we say that uh, animals they are rational beings, or we say they are autonomous, they are autonomous agents, then like, in human society we have some certain rules and ethics applied to, to like, restrict, restrict some human behavior. For example, like, we can't kill each other. Like, it, it's wrong. Like, like, and that's also applied to animals, but there's a Change the 
<laughs> well, first I agree with both Jim and you that no animal would start to paint by itself. Of course. So that's one side of it. But the other side of it is Bantam's approach. You know, because these elephants would die in woods because uh, they were not needed in production no more. So some of them went to a circus and were treated very badly, of course. Uh, and some of them just died uh, in, in, in the woods where they were not, they were not used anymore to, to survive in natural habitat. So this what was done, Bentham would say, was much better in utilitarian terms than how they lived before this gap. That's, that's uh, I would say, something we should consider. So yes, of course they are not artists. You know. They are used as an uh, artistic instrument like you use perhaps now uh, 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 internet to, to create artworks and so on. But still, you know, it's, uh, it's a, a, a step into a direction which I would say that still we, we, we will uh, step by step understand not that animals are rational beings, but let's say conscious beings, but also that uh, animals are creative and that uh, animals have all we have just in different proportions which are perfect for their own survival, but this survival is not possible anymore because we change this world so that we have to intervene in our culture, which has become a natural culture in Anthropocene, for the world to survive. They cannot change themselves so quickly as we are uh, destroying their habitats. Mm -hmm. So we have to do something, and they will become cultural animals, we want it or not. The culture, we have to keep an eye on them, we have to keep them alive. Last question, we have two minutes, Lucian. Uh, it seems to me like uh, human and animal relationships don't necessarily have to be bad, but they become bad on the whole because of being part of a capitalist system that seeks to exploit them for profit. I was wondering if you think that is the case, that capitalism creates these um, relationships that are exploitative. Well, relations of exploitation were created in all systems. <laughs> not just in capitalism. So what I wanted to say is that specificity of capitalism is that uh, people become a commodity because they have to sell what they are able to do to the others. And uh, in, this, in this case, of course, the animals cannot get the special treatment Francione wants for them if you do not recognize that also humans shouldn't be commodities. And humans became a commodity under capitalism, yeah, because capital needs this circulation also with, with human force being involved in, in creation and in work and so on. We've come to the end of our session. Let's give a big round of applause. <laughs> Don't anybody go anywhere. <laughs> We've uh, got another session right here uh, coming up.